it's time for a special day where we're going to reverend, <laughs> no, we're going to welcome our very special reverend, Reverend John Scott, the beloved, who will bring us our message this morning of light and love and hope and joy and a little homework. Please help me welcome Reverend John. Good morning, Worldwide Spiritual Family. A joy to add my own words of welcome to this morning's celebration of all that is wonderful, all that is beautiful, all that is true in our world. And I have to say a special welcome to my friend Stephanie Kerrins, who usually is online watching us from her home in Ireland, but who is in Jamaica and in our sanctuary this morning. So welcome to our hearts, Stephanie. Love you. And those of you online, you know we love you enough, enough, enough. And thank you for being here and for being part of this amazing consciousness known as the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. So it's Woman's Month. <laughs> and so I thought I'd start by sharing something with you that I got on the internet. It's about a man on his Harley, his motorcycle, riding along a California beach when suddenly the sky opens and God's voice booms out at him. Because you have tried to be faithful to me in all ways, I will grant you one wish. Well, he screeches to a halt. He pulls over and he says, Ah, your majesty, build a bridge to Hawaii so I can ride over anytime I want. There's a silence. And the creator replies, Well, your request is a, a, a bit materialistic, to say the least. Why don't you th think about the enormous impact and challenges of this kind of undertaking? We're going to have to send pylons and concrete and steel into the floor of the Pacific. It's going to upset the ecology and all just for a joy ride on your, on your Harley. Why don't you think of something more, more spiritual and beneficial to humankind? So he feels a bit chagrin, so he, he considers for a while and thought to himself. And then he said, okay, I want to understand me and all men. What is it that women really want? I want to understand what makes them cry when they're happy and what they're thinking when they're silent, when I... I, I say, honey, what's the matter? And she says, matter? Something should be the matter. I want to know what is their passion? What do they really want? And there's a silence. And God says, how many lanes do you want on that highway? Two or four? <laughs> you know, throughout history, my friends, People have asked that question. People have just wanted to know, what is it about this mysterious creation of God? How can we better understand? My friend Bob and his wife decided to go on a diet for Lent. And so last Friday, his wife proposed that they have a cheat day, and Bob liked it. So Friday evening, the wife brought home Kentucky fried KFC with hot wings and fries and a tub of ice cream. Bob brought home his secretary. So from his, hotel, from his hospital bed, he is wondering, when will men ever understand what women want? But there's a way, my friend, that I want us to, exp to explore this morning. And March, being celebrated as Women's Month, is a good time for us to, to really think about this. Our own temple was, was founded by a remarkable woman, um, Dr. Elma Lumsden. And she never actually told me, but she lived from a, a consciousness. And she used to say to me, you know, when you know the truth, you don't have to proclaim it. I don't have to walk around saying I'm a woman. Everybody can see that. So that's a good place for us to begin. What can we see? 
and how can we understand this feminine mystique which has challenged poets and philosophers and writers and artists and musicians and people in every walk of life throughout the ages. So let me begin by sharing with you a, a story from the tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. King Arthur was a young king and was caught and imprisoned by the king of a neighboring kingdom. The king could have killed him, but he was, I guess, fascinated by the energy and the youth and the, the, the brashness of this young King Arthur. And so he said, I will spare your life if you can answer one question. You will have a year to travel the world over and find the answer to the question, what do women really want? And if at the end of the year you, you haven't, then the laws of chivalry demand that you return to my kingdom to be put to death. So Arthur set off and he traveled the whole world, far and wide, uphill and down dale, speaking to philosophers and poets and musicians and mathematicians and wise people and humble people who till the fields and provide bread. He spoke to women themselves. He spoke to people all over the world and nobody could give him a satisfactory answer. And the year was coming to a close. And so he decided to go back to Camelot to say goodbye to his people and then to present himself as chivalry demanded to the, the king that had captured him to be put to death. And in his own kingdom, one of the people said, you know, there is one last hope. There is a witch who lives at the top of the hill and we are sure she can give you the answer. But the problem with this was that she charged enormous amounts for her services. But Arthur thought, well, there's no price too high to pay for this knowledge. It would save his life and preserve the tradition of the round table. So he went to the witch. <laughs> The price she demanded for giving him this knowledge, this life-saving knowledge, was that she wished to marry Gawain. Sir Gawain was the most gallant and wonderful knight of the round table, and he was Arthur's personal friend. He was a Bessie Wessie to Arthur. And Arthur said, no, I can't ask my best friend to do this, because this witch was really horrible. She smelled like the sewers. She had no teeth, there was snot draining from her nostrils, and she just really was, was repulsive. But Gawain, being a knight of the round table, said to Arthur, my friend, there is no price too high to pay. I will marry the witch. And so Arthur said, Gawain will marry you. And the witch told him the answer to this question. What a woman really wants is to be able to be in charge of her own life. What a woman really wants, the old witch said, is to be able to be in charge of her own destiny, her own life. And so Arthur went to the king and gave the answer. Everybody knew that this was a profound and great truth. And so Arthur's life was spared by the king. What a wedding feast there was for Gawain and the witch. It was magnificent. And the witch, well, Gawain was at his very best as a knight would be courteous and chivalrous and, and wonderful. And the witch was her most hideous self. She slobbered her food, dropping it all over the table. She ate with her fingers. She, she coughed and spluttered all over everybody at the table and she made everybody thoroughly uncomfortable. And so as the wedding night approached, Gawain was in fear and trembling. And so he divested himself of his armor and put on his seamless 
night robe, the wedding gown, the wedding night gown, and approached the royal wedding chamber. And when he opened the door, a sight presented itself to him that took his breath away. There, reclining on the couch, was the most beautiful maiden he had ever in his life seen. And he was totally taken aback. I don't understand, what's this? And she explained that she had been bewitched. And because he had been so chivalrous and so wonderful at the wedding feast and not showing any, as we would say in Jamaica, bad face, the spell had been half broken. And so what would happen was for half of every 24 hours, she would be this awful, repulsive, stinking witch. And for the other half of every 24 hours, she would be the beautiful, beautiful woman that was lying on the couch in the royal wedding chamber. And she said to him, which part of the day would you like me to be the witch and which part of the day would you like me to be the beautiful maiden? And Gawain was, was in a quandary. I guess if it was today, he would have WhatsApped his best friend to say, what I must do. But in those days, the days of the round table, I think all they had was carrier pigeon. And no pigeons came near the witch's dwelling. And so he said to her, my lady, you choose. And there was a flash of light. And something miraculous happened. She said, you have broken the spell. And because you have honored me and given me the right to choose, I will be the beautiful queen for your kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Yes. So, autonomy and the right to choose. But my friends, there is another story that I want to share with you that would perhaps give us a deeper insight into the role that women really play. And in doing so and exploring this other story I'm going to share with you, it is important that we learn and understand the relationship between the male and feminine aspects of ourselves. Because deep within each of us is the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. And the two have never been at war. The two were meant to work together in harmony. And the story that, that for me underlines this truth is to be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 9 to 14. And it is about the meeting of the master teacher, Jesus, with the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. And you know this story. You may have read it many times. But let me just read it for you quickly. Jesus, you see, was traveling in enemy territory. It was not safe for a Jew to be traveling that road. And she was also unsafe because she was an unaccompanied woman on her own, gone to draw water. And here is what the gospel says occurred. I quote, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest to drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And there's a kind of author's note, For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. 
But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. A well of water drawn by a woman for the Savior to become a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Because, my friends, when the male and the female aspects of ourself meet at the well of ourself and drink of that living water, we never have to thirst after the right useness of the law, after an understanding of each other and the roles that we play and the complementary way the universe has created us to be a complete package, to go through life relying on the intuition of the woman and the drive and energy of the man, the masculine energy. So there is no need for competition. There is only need for collaboration, for us to hold hands and walk the road from good to greater good, from glory to greater glory, to the honor of our God. So you see, metaphysically, the woman in any Bible story represents the feminine within each of us, the feminine aspects of ourselves. And that aspect of being signifies intuitive perception and natural love. So the story of the woman at the well is showing us that the intuition and natural love which is inherent in each of us draws life to the surface. In other words, it brings forth all of the goodness of life. And so I want to suggest that the next time that you are faced with a problem, go within to the well of self and ask of the woman at your well, ask of the feminine aspect of your being, what is the right way to go? And if you are still and listen to that still small voice, it will keep your feet upon the perfect path. Because when you draw from that well, as the master teacher said, and drink deeply of the truth that we are complementary, that we are not at war with each other, that we need to honor each other in the roles that we have been created to play, there can only be cooperation and life and love and laughter and the joy of being divine beings ex having a human experience. So like Jesus, that water, and water represents the universal solvent, the solution of all life in potential. What a wonderful thought. Every time you wash your hands or drink a glass of water or, or shower, think about this that you are, you are using the universal solvent of all life in potential. And when you pour that water into a mold and freeze it, it will take the shape of the mold that you have poured it into, yes? So are you pouring the water of life into the mold of love, of joy, of compassion, of being your fullest and your highest and your most wonderful self? All of you, not just the male of you, not just the female of you, but all of you. Because in Genesis we're told male and female created he them. We are both. There is no competition. There is only the blending of all the aspects of ourself so that our lives may honor and glorify the creator of all life. Let us affirm together, I honor and revere the sacred feminine aspect of my being. Together, I honor and revere the sacred feminine aspect of my being. You know, in the past, the feminine was erroneously regarded as illogical, weak, undependable, and sometimes downright dangerous. And where did this myth, you know, this, this, this um, Chimamanda, um, says in her, one of her writings that there's a danger to the single story. When did this, this idea begin to be generated that, that 
the feminine aspect is dangerous. We know we can't live without it. We know that it is the, the vessel through which life comes. The sacred feminine is perhaps the most powerful faculty we could, we could employ to handle the problems that the world faces today. So when did this happen? When did we begin to believe the big lie that something is inherently deficient or wrong or, or lacking? Because the vessel that brings forth life can only be sacred and beautiful and glorious. I've told you the story about a, a young participant in our program at the prison who had um, himself and his, his baby mother were expecting their first child and he wasn't able to get her to the hospital uh, because there was a, a neighborhood war. And so he ended up having to deliver that baby himself. And he told this story in, a, in one of our Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life classes at the prison. And every man was on the edge of his seat because most men can't even imagine the miracle and the, the majesty and the amazing occurrence that happens when a new life is brought into the world. And so they were on the edge of their seats and they were saying, what you do? What you do? Uh, what you do? And he said, me boil water. Me boil, I said, well, them, you boil water? She said, him says, you don't watch the movie them. Every show, them show you how them boil water. I full up every condensed can and every mile of tin and I boil water. But the bottom line was he delivered his child. And friends, when I said to him, how did you feel? He said, feel? I don't know how I feel. But I know how God must feel when he created us. And he said, I believe, and he's about 22 or 23 years old, you know. He said, I believe every man in Jamaica should have to watch his child being born. And that there'll be no more abuse of women, no more misunderstanding of the relationship that we have. And the same love that we have for our mumadem, because you know in Jamaica we love our mothers. That same love would be extended to the cradle of creation that is every woman on the planet. Wow. And so my friends, I want you to think about the blend and how you combine your sacred feminine with your sacred masculine. And let the woman at your well give you to drink so that the masculine and feminine within you have the, no need to be at war. They will work together to create an amazing experience of your life. I want to, to give you your assignment. Every time you take a drink of water this week, and you should be drinking lots of water, sip it mindfully and affirm silently. I drink deeply from the well of life. I drink deeply from the well of life. It is the well of self fed by God my never-failing source. I drink deeply from the well of life. It is the well of self fed by God, my never-failing source. Can we say that together? I drink deeply from the well of life. I drink deeply from the well of life. It is the well of self fed by God, my unfailing source. Ernest Holmes, who gave us this great teaching, writes in his magnum opus, The Science of Mind, and I quote, Spirituality, springing from within, coming from that never-failing source of life which quenches every thirst, whose source is eternity, the wellspring of self-existence. Spirituality springs from within, coming from that never-failing source of life which quenches every thirst, whose source is eternity, the wellspring of self-existence. So my friends, when we drink that wellspring of self-existence, we will know that what women really want 
indeed what we all want and what we must have because it is ours by divine right of being is the right to choose. And the scripture says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Namaste. Did I tell you? Reverend John scores again, but without competition. It's all about collaboration, not competition. As we drink deeply from the well of life, knowing that God is our infinite, abiding, ever faithful source. Thank you again, Reverend John.